Hi, everybody, and welcome to the continuing Visiting Artists Lecture Series that we've been doing now for the last few years. We've had some wonderful guests, and today is no exception. I want to welcome Shane Hope. And Shane is uh, an artist that I've known and I've been in shows with over the last few years. What's uh, especially impressive about Shane, he's an incredibly intelligent guy. He's got philosophy in his work, he's got technology in his work, and he has also a sensibility about the future. He's speculating in a sense about the future. So when I say philosophy, I think especially object-oriented ontology and maybe speculative re realism is a part of his approach to work. The other thing about Shane is he makes his living by selling his work. He's an active artist in New York and Brooklyn, and he does an absolutely fantastic job of it. Uh, I think if you looked at his works at first, you'd think, oh, what a lovely piece. It's a kind of lyrical abstraction. It's very painterly and formal. But then when you get to know Shane and his, his hopes and ambitions and intentions for the work, you kind of maybe get a little bit blown away by how much theory and ideas are in the work. So without further ado, I want to welcome Shane Hope. Thanks. Uh, I typically start by suggesting that it's a research-based practice in which I'm engaged. And uh, it's also a, an oblique form of future studies. And by that, I mean it's influenced by techno-progressive, transhumanist, H+, hard sci-fi, and singularitarian ideas and rhetoric. So we're talking about ethics and emerging technology, speculating with regard to the ramifications and or you know, what, what happens you know, after certain um, um, kinds of technological progressions. Uh, as you can tell, it's, quite, it's verbose and, and there's quite a lot of text involved with what it is I do. And, and so to begin, I thought I would, I would just do something almost nearly a poetry slam-ish and uh, show you what it looks like when you, when you condense a bunch of future studies into two minutes of speech. Uh, it, what I'm about to share is a speculative vernacular description of the future. And you can follow along. It's called Things Executing Things. Scribbling, scriptable, scalable, species, tool beings, quacker casting, computonium clouds of kilo IQ, collab, object oriented, co op, corporeal, commons clusters, play ring, post scarcity, percept, pus. Impression, peekaboo, public panopticon, powder plunder, and gray complexus, thunk up a tree's cubit, built quilting algorithm, cracked out, chunk DNA, anarchies to unanablock, anomic lock, find jewels, bots, I got sots of watts. Spin information, support, and scenariopolis, strap, trauma, root, economical, and zyme, and rhyme, and schmodder, fodder for smart, dust storming, mass, mod, mood, meds, running on you. Running on hyper necker death cubes, cutest spore casting, synthetic, smart, officially exprisoned, empathic, Logically infectious, connectivized, cognitarians called upon to camouflage the protocol lenization of every thinkingness up one on a life file path towards a massive sapient ratiocracy, getting smart faced and uploaded, adding add ons off your overclocker, rocker, perved POV, vapor, X mint, writes too far, edge, soil, the green tea party, upload side your headers of bequest or bot, blobject, hoodlumist, bucky luck, lock, logic, cages, gates, kaput, and handicrafted ECAP in your app, potential meat, splaced out, smart matter, manufacturally, date stampede, data debased, and diagrammatic, copulation, commodity, cross sections of compound, cutaway, exploded view, shish kabombs, higher dimensionally, hacking, hawking, cam flame, liggy logging, one man bandwidth, biochipping off the old. Bad blocks, punch lines punching the overclocking, crow naughty, cognitive haze, phraseologies, pharmaceutically focusing, femto fractured, fluid identified, flesh anistas, fee will and click fraud, false flag fishing, from mass taken out plentity, so omega pointless, slash dot to dot, subthreaded, but by cell utility, swarms of soul splinter fearing, speculative vernacular, and some splay skitty snarfing sporgers on me no zoos. Transubstantially time sharing, tagging, environmentally challenged, infomorphic bio routers, back scattering bloodstream, slumming it up, hick hack, instantial thought barrier, robber baron, sentient sopper, sea source, serum, sci fi, the straight, more feral, fog, fab fertilizers for forticode, from misalignment. Matter, mogul, mash, mobsters, manipulate, malformation, anti money, yay, markets for meta competitive metabolisms of things, executing things. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> so it, it, it starts here. This is actually about the time I was in, engaging in the, in the, the textual uh, antics and uh, doing the future studies proper, that is, reading. Um, people who actually do futurology for a living. Uh, and there were these drawings in, in various uh, apps at the time. I think I was, I was really into like flowchart software and trying to make drawings and specifically flowchart software that would otherwise you know, be, be used to communicate specific ideas and specific sale, uh, cells with you know, specific connections to other ideas and so on. But then like actually use that itself as a, as a material 
Uh, this was a this is a speculation about seeing eye surfaces. So, if you if you take a if you take a, something that is bioluminescent, but then also um, um, uh, it's like imagine an eyeball stretched over an entire surface of a of a system. So you know uh, there is plays on words: tape eye, I O error, um, nanoptical. So it's 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 small, but it's optical, and and so on. You get you get the you get that cyclops. Um, uh, they were kind of like reference swarms. So, like as I was doing research, I would, you know, have a speculation, but then I would also just, you know, reach reach into history or into cross disciplinary and like pull uh, images and, and ideas um, and and just kind of like compress them into the the same same sort of pictorial space to see what happened. This uh, here's the get, get smart face and uploaded. Uh, 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 and I'll get to this later, but I became kind of really interested in what happens when building and growing sort of become the same thing. We take for granted that you know we assemble things, we put things together, but uh, I claim it will soon come to pass that you, it will be hard to tell what is what is grown or or, or literally put together, um, you know, from the molecule or the atom up, and what is assembled from the top down. So in this case, it's like there's a robot, but it's grown from a single cell and. Uh, you, you can you can read some of the text-based stuff there. This is the, an idea that like, um, uh, it, it, and this is somewhat true to the, to the, you know we have we have um, laterally transferred bacteria and, and other uh, living uh, ecosystems essentially in us as us. We we don't even realize they're there because they're so virtually indivis uh, in, invisible. But it, so this is the idea that like okay your your interior is made up of another uh, of a colony of entities. And I could talk about this later because one of the other big issues uh, about speculation in sci-fi and um, and dip trying to depict the future, in other words, is that um, there's never really the issue of scale. Like ev you know, everything in movies and such happens at our scale, right? I mean, for dramatic reasons, and we're the audience, right? But but you know, quite a lot of innovation w w won't won't happen at our scale. It'll happen at things larger or smaller, and they'll be hard to depict. And they're certainly hard to narrativize, right? This is the idea that you have two entities growing separately, but then they kind of conjoin, but later. Kind of like uh, two plants growing into the same flo floral system or something, but as biological entities. I call these speculative documents because they're documents, but they're drawings. I mean, to my no knowledge, I think I coined that term. Uh, I coined lots of neologisms, so I'll, I'll try to point out like what words I've made up and, and actually like have been credited for as I as I go along. Uh, this is atomic clown atomic clown nose cluster, uh, common age of clown cone clown clone computronium. Uh, I'll get to that later. I'll try to breeze through these. These are sort of earlier works and and and, and, and um, precedents uh, or um, you know when moving forward to some of the more uh, fabricated uh, 3D print and manufacturer oriented stuff. Speculative vernacular their blog botherings. Uh, uh, around it, this is like around Web 3.0 and blogosphere and so on. I was like, okay, I'll I'll yeah, I'll, I'll I'll make these paintings, but and they'll be blog posts, but they'll look like really early websites. And then also I'll have them painted in China, and then with the expre express condition that the Chinese painter couldn't finish it. So all these pa all these paintings are, uh, and again, it's all this speculative verbiage. I'm uh, cute computronium kitties. I'm talking about you know um, you know uh, mind children or children in computational or, or non biological substrates. Uh, it's full of typos and and misspellings on purpose because actually what brilliantly happened is because they're painted by someone who's Chinese, they paint it like a picture, they don't understand the characters, so they introduced a bunch of more errors and, and they actually ended up reading even better than when I sent them. Uh, here's another one. And these are like eight feet too, so they're quite, I mean, they're, they're large in there and, uh, yeah, you can you can see it's, it's actually really quite difficult to to make it so that they agreed to unfinish them or or just not finish them. <laughs> yeah, you can see this like it's like early early win Windows aesthetic. 
temporally uh, pre-moved. Um, so you're all familiar with, like, if, you're, if you've gone into a museum and something will be on loan, you know, something won't be there. And what's in its stead is a, like a card or you know, some sort of indication that it's been removed for curatorial purposes or it's on loan to another museum or it's being restored or some such. I thought, I, I got really fascinated with those uh, in this sense. I, re, I renamed it temporally pre-moved because I was speculating, uh, uh, this was a, a sort of a um, project space uh, uh, series of works I did text-based, but they're drawn, so they're documents again. I'm hand-drawing these things to, to look like wall placards for artwork that can't be there yet. So I'm speculating and describing things that couldn't be there. Maybe they could at a later time, but they're temporally pre-moved, so they weren't even there then. Like, right, so, <laughs> and, and they all, uh, they are all on loan and stuff for, for really interesting reasons. Like this one's on, yeah, transubstratio loan. Um, and, you know, if you're quick, you can read them a bit, but... Oh, another thing to mention is that I actually used a bot to, to do the text or the paragraphs. Um, I inserted a bunch of my own verbiage and stuff I've culled from research, shoved them into these, like, um, um, uh, like auto uh, paragraph generator bots. And then what came out on the other side reads like this. And it, and it reads so, it, it, I mean, it basically reads like spam, right? Like one of your spam emails that you get like about Ni Nigerian schemes and, and such. But except this is, you know, it's like it trying to describe its own future, I thought. Like, um, uh, it's been speculated that like the spam bot technology and or like trying to convince humans that you're a human, i.e. The, the Turing test, you can talk about that, will actually happen in like um, adware and, sp and spam before anything else, like so the AGI guys are trying to like make intelligence, it might actually happen just because, you know, uh, the, the competition to get eyeballs over, over ads and stuff. Um, this one's inter, interspecies study. This is why that one was removed. Uh, let's see, that one's, oh, for gene ripping and unpatenting. I liked the idea of being able to extract a patent out of something. Uh, Let's see, POV plumbing, okay, yeah. Uh, then it, I, at a certain point I thought, okay, I'll, 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 I'll do something that's not strictly text-based, it's text-oriented, folk copytronium laptops. Uh, I, I did a stint at Skowhegan, and, um, and near Skowhegan, there was this like demolition, there was a pile of like demolished uh, homes. It was like a, it was, um, it was like a housing demolition salvage is what it was, just a pile. So it was a junkyard exclusive to just sort of like, you have like window, bits of window and, and doors and paneling and leftover paint. and. Uh, Anyway, and, and Skowhegan's a good residency because they actually will like help you like find all these like you know really bizarre sources of, of material while you're there. I think some like many residencies kind of help you do that. So this is what I, this is what I did. I wanted to you know kind of um, do a f freeze frame of like the state of laptops at the time. I was there. This is 2006. It's not too long ago. Uh, from the salvage. You know, like you could tell it's like 70s floor tile, like cut into the keys and, and, and that, uh, I forget what that, that backdrop thing is there, but, you know, they're modeled on computers that were contemporary and or uh, get these like East Coast iron hinges, you know, and all, all, this is, all this is free and I made a bunch of them that summer. Computronium um, is, a, is a futurist sort of sci-fi, hard sci-fi concept uh, that basically suggests that instead of specific substrates like silicon um, or, or even before that vacuum tubes, um, you, you could compute on dumb matter. Like eventually we'll get to the point where we're just like computing on this stuff. Like we're computing on, like in other words, the computational um, density 
uh, of, of objects is, is going to accelerate, as, as people suggest. Uh, I mean, like the, the, right now, actually, there's some of you may or may not know there's a um, there's a gold rush to figure out what the next silicon is because silicon's ending. The silicon era is ending. Like we can't write on it any smaller. That's why everything's like parallel processed or or multi-core. Uh, but uh, so people are trying to uh, think in terms of like three-dimensional molecular strategies. Graphene is a huge candidate. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, DNA computing, there's people trying to actually compute on, on, on bio. Um, so we, we, you know, we might have computational systems in our cells that, that aren't uh, um, uh, inorganic or aren't you know, um, non-biological. Oh, here's another one. So they ran the gamut of being like ultra simple to like, like so this even has like a C CD. Uh, <laughs> Compiled right. Okay, so now here's where I was like, okay, um, when you know, because you, usually when people think that someone's working with the with the uh, someone's a futurist or someone's working with future content, you know, they, they go to dystopic, you know, dystopic or dystopic types of visions, and um, they're actually futurists uh, and people I know. They, there's a word for like what most artists do with um, future technology, and it's called disaster baiting. Art artists typically disaster bait with, with ideas about the future. They idly fantasize about you know, uh, tragedies and or you know, that which went wrong you know, by way of, of some, um, some technological advancement, right? Well, I wanted to do the opposite of that, or like patch that, somehow figure out how, how to do something that's seemingly innocuous, almost innocent, just like a rote description of like how stuff's going to be. Uh, because that's, that's where we are now, like there's stuff that we live with like all the time now that a hundred years ago like people would have just not only freaked out about, they might have like assassinate you, like it would just be such a breach in, you know, or they would imagine, you know, that, that we wouldn't have been able to be sustainable as a culture with the stuff we have even now. And this kind of, you know, always happens. Anyway, anyway, I was like, okay, here's what I'll do. Um, <laughs> I'll make these drawings from the perspective of mind children that haven't been built yet. Or so, like, I'll use the idea of a picture text grade school, like, aesthetic in order to present these ideas that would otherwise, in a disasterpatory way, like really uh, concern people, right? Or just send them to, to the wrong sides of, of certain arguments. So, so here's, I made too much, you know, the kid made too many copies of himself. And so his mom grounds him as a singleton so that he can't make copies of himself, right? He's just like, yeah, this is just what happened to me, you know? Dear Plexus, thank you for teaching us how to, to use uh, the, the development tools of a deep empathy engine. You know, the, the idea that we could actually start to like code for uh, empathy, for feelings. I mean, there are people actually thinking about this right now, programmable feelings. Uh, being able to like, like we could, if everyone in here is argue me, arguing, you just dose the whole place with oxytocin and everyone gets all bonding and, you know. <laughs> um, I was waiting in different merge for my fork. Me and me were so different, but we still merged. Uh, Again, the idea of, of, of having to deal with the idea of splintering and then uh, merging, you know, having to actually deal with like copies of yourself. Divis as an individual, like not an individual, but a individual. Uh, the, the, the important bit in here, dying is illegal. <laughs> like that, that bit, like, you know, you couldn't, you couldn't terminate, uh, you know, your, your final instance of yourself, say. Um, or that which was your sort of, you know, culturally embedded, implemented self, rather than the one we kind of, you know, think is, is only ours. These are my very own exocortices. So instead of having a cortex, you have, you know, a morning star constellation of exocortical enhancements and, and tool, you know, like this, but like, you know. Um, Foglets and me, uh, I, like, I like to play in utility fog. But most, most of all, I like to make it make stuff. So, so here, here you have, and this is maker culture, or the beginnings of maker culture as an, as an idea, is like making stuff that then makes stuff. 
And you know, there's some there's some really interesting like infinite regressive pitfalls that happen like when you're making stuff that makes 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 stuff, and then like, there's there's litigation, there's like liability. Who who like what if you made something that made something that made something? Are you responsible for the third border of like you know what gets made? Uh, utility fog is an interesting futurist idea. It's uh, kind of akin to um, um, computronium. It's programmable matter. Okay, so like imagine you have a shape-shifting object, but then imagine that it's it's the size of dust. And then imagine that it's massively networked and can communicate with all the other shape-shifting bits of dust. Then all of a sudden you have like instant objecthood, like when you want it. it you know, walls or no walls or extensions of yourself or, or no self. This is um, yeah, very rarely in, in, in sci-fi does this work out because, you know, again, the, the possibilities of when, once you have that kind of system of emergent complexity are pretty crazy. Like, you could immediately just go, like, hurricane. You know, like, <laughs> you just whip up literally, you know, scaled events that, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't otherwise be feasible, right? Uh, gray goo will so brute force to flesh dust. Another really interesting idea in terms of nano uh, is uh, the... Uh, Gray goo is um, the idea, basically, that if you have a, um, a nanoscaled self-replicating entity or agent that, like, you know, has to sequester carbon in order to make copies of itself, then it would, I think, in like 15 days, reduce the Earth to gray goo. In other words, the whole surface of the planet in 15 days. You know, I f forget who did the the calculation, but you know, it just takes apart everything with carbon in it to make copies of itself and stuff. So, uh, anyway, but I, I, I like this idea, like. Like like this kid or something is the really excited about it. Like yeah, they so so brute force defleshed us because it's like well, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm an infomorph. Uh, an infomorph is um, you know I can get into this if if you want because it's th uh, there's actually a really good ar object oriented ontological argument against the co the possibility of con copying consciousness. Like consciousness may be such a moving complex target that you couldn't. You can't just lift it and then put it somewhere else. And if you do, then that's a that's a very functionalist, like you know, and um, you know, almost suspiciously uh, uh, monetizable thing to do in terms of uh, of social relations. But but anyway, infomorph is like the idea of a copy of yourself in another substrate. So like you you like you running on something else that isn't your body and your bio and your biology. I jumped out of my meat body. So again, the idea oh, I could just. You just jump out. I can make microbes make, uh, you know, aka uh, synthetic uh, biology. Uh, iGEM, you know, there's a huge movement right now to sort of break down uh, uh, cellular, you know, biological machinery in order to then, you know, make tools at the cellular scale. So yeah, um, um, bioremediation uh, is a, is a big deal. You know, making uh, it, it won't be too long. Well, we might have something in the kitchen. That like you, you, it's bacteria, and you feed it some sugar, and then out comes like some some product we need. Um, they're doing it to clean up oil spills and make make bioplastics and stuff. Uh, the singularity came too soon for mums and dads. So yeah, this is that that funny sort of generational thing, right? Like that we might make for entities that you know are, are privy to other uh, systems advanced in certain ways that it's not just a generation gap it's like a like like imagine if you made an entity that thought twice as fast as you so they had to like wait to talk to you all the time that would get really you know it'd be hard to do and then imagine something thinking a hundred times faster than you like that's the other thing that never happens in like film and such you never have conversations where people are running at two different paces and 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 you know some of the best sort of short form sci-fi stories actually deal with some of those social problems that would happen once once that started to happen uh built day yeah so rather than birthday uh, it's how i refer to my birthday now I, oh yeah no last week was my built day yeah uh my me yeah what happened what happened instead of what happened what happened our self solution was so messy um, uh, lots and lots of naked dumb matter. Uh, this is that idea that, like, you know, we might fetishize computation on everything, to the, to the extent that it might be quite a relief to be around dumb matter again. That matter that isn't smart, 
You know, you've probably even heard the phrase smart matter, right? Like w once you happen upon something that was dumb and or like was not or, you know, dumb only if you thought it should be smart, but it's just matter if, if you know, the same as it ever was. Uh, that might be quite a relief, like, you know, going to a, a park, you know, or, or a preserve, right? Be like preserved matter that, you know, wasn't smart, right? That might be refreshing. Might take a vacation there. Uh, my dad almost got cached, <laughs> you know, cached, not caught, but cached uh, by an archivore. Uh, so the ends bit interesting there, spend him like money. Um, yeah, it, it could come to pass that things even like consciousness uh, may be fungible. Um, some, some really good authors play around with this idea of the fungibility of, of self-awareness and consciousness. So you could buy and sell and trade with it like money. Um, uh, it's a different scale or order of thinking about you know, what it is to be in, in relationships, but nonetheless, none funny idea. Uh, <laughs> your mom is open source. Yeah, the open source. <laughs> Linux geeks in here will love this. Um, yeah, I thought this is like the major cap or bag to someone's mom, right? Like, yeah, your, your mom, she gets it, gives it away for free. Your mom, your mom's open source. You know, like, yeah, like you'd want the proprietary mom, right? That charges <laughs> licensing fees and stuff because she's all right. But, but I thought this is uh, my potential me space was not in the place where I put it. Uh, yeah, mom dumped its mass into empty dimensions. Uh, goop with the family um, to print a printer. I mean, one, one of the speculated like early versions of, of the self-replication, the runaway self-replication problem was like printers printing printers. Uh, and, and I'll get to the RepRap thing, but that was like, like uh, open source and DIY 3D printing, you know, had at its, at its beginnings, uh, ex except in the, in the companies that like actually were getting patents for it. The idea that like it could print most of its own parts or that, you, that, that should be the goal over time is that everyone should be helping everyone print more of the parts for the printers so they could disseminate ever faster, right? Uh, it should be, you know, approach exponential or some such. Wet work with C Persipus. The end of that's nice. Um, I tried to reselve, but I don't fit in a skull anymore. <laughs> you know, I, uh, 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 what's, what's his name? Uh, I'll remember later. AGI researcher. He he once someone asked him if we, you know if you wanted to upload, and and what that would be like. And a lot of the guys that are actually working on AGI are actually working on um, um, human level uh, intelligent systems. They um, yeah they 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 they're not the stereotype. They actually do have better answers to questions like that. He said the important thing to to concern ourselves with is not. Um, Jumping into another substrate and 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 um, advancing and or um, accelerating too fast because just like we do every day, we change very gradually. That's why even uh, Kurzweil, uh, it's it's Ger um, uh, ah, I almost said Gertzel, yeah. Uh, Kurzweil even says that like we'll we'll transition slowly into these things, exocortical enhancements, but you know no one's going to take just a leap. You know, in, in in the short term, anyway, uh, and it ha it has to be gradual because if you if if you jump too quickly, you just like become a, the god version of yourself, and you completely obliterate everything that went ha that happened before. It would be like amnesic. You it would be like being in a car accident, and having, you know, like if you replace such a chunk of like what you're running on with something else, the the transition will be too abrupt, too quick, too. And so he was actually arguing for like, no, we have to slow it down and enjoy it you know like we, we always have to be becoming god we can't just like skip like you know and and it's kind of a lesson to uh got all glitchy and his yeah you know, cheats ripped up our neuronal mapping just i like the idea that like, you can rebuild your neuronal map that like helps you interface with the like, gaming engine but that would be stacked on real life i mean the thing is you know artificial um or augmented reality is coming right but it won't just come like in a way that just maps on this. It's going to be stacks of it, and it's going to be privileged stacks and not so privileged stacks. And there's going to be a hierarchy of like what you can see in this corner, but that guy can't see. And then you're going to be like snickering, like ha ha, look what's over there. That poor guy's not going to know. And you know, it's going to be all of that. Um, 
uh, stuff. This is about buying bodies, you know, for the exmit rights, afterlife thing. Uh, yeah, resurrect some relatives. Uh, just the idea, like, um, uh, Black Mirror has been doing a good job at dealing with some of these issues. Like, the, they had the resurrection issue. They had the, from, from data, from, like, one's um, um, Facebook and or, like, social media platforms. And you could, you could harvest enough material and interactions that you could, like, get something that's approximate to your former relative, you know? Um, uh, floating, interfluid, yeah, restore me from backup. You know, the idea that you could have backups. I think I'm coming to the end of these. Solar ain't a more tech, halting states still suck. I mean, the, 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 the computational or um, CS folks in here will know that a haunting, uh, halting state just means, you know, it, whatever the computation was, it stopped. Uh, it's kind of like a um, computer science geek version of saying death. Like, so if you, you know, I didn't die, I achieved halting state, you know, or something like that. Um, buy species, spend species, again, sort of fungible, uh, the, the idea of trading in, in, in organisms. Uh, skip that one. Yeah, mind kindness, uh, don't want to die. So this is about die, and that, like, he claims it's free, doesn't cost anything. Uh, Non-living things have been uplifted or perved. Uh, Werner Vinci deals with this idea a lot of like a perved object or um, perved flying mini nodes or you know like like a whole networks of, of systems that have been you know, perverted uh, and uplifting a number of figures like uh, George Dvorsky and actually there are like conferences sort of happening about the, the idea of uplift. So like I explain this this will help some of you like Okay, there's, it's one thing to argue that like AGIs or artificial intelligences on other substrates ought to like you know have like bill of rights or have you know be, be treated as actual citizens, um, and and though it's it that's related to how we already treat some other organisms, uh, including like chimps. I, I may, some of you may know that there's a there's a court case actually to liberate chimps chimps in the, in New York to actually give them like kind of a, a, a bill of rights. Um, can't incarcerate chimps and so on. So actually, there's a there's a weird connection most people don't know about between like how we treat, you know, animals, you know, nearly is, as smart as us, and that that's a whole you know can of worms there too. How it is you assess, you know, wh whether or not something has you know a, a complicated enough central nervous system and and stuff. Because you know why not jellyfish? Like, you know. Anyway, so we like dolphins and great apes and chimps and you know even maybe elephants. Maybe in in route to um, um, actually participating uh, in, you know, ha have something equivalent to the rights of children, because I, you know, because children, human children have like really special rights too. Like they can get away with so much, and it ends up blamed on the parents and so on. Same thing would be for these animals, but the same thing would be go go on for computational stuff. Uplifting. It, this is a long way to get to uplifting. Upli uplifting means you imbue something that didn't normally, that didn't previous or hitherto have human level intelligence, but then does. So it'd be like, all of a sudden your dog talks. You know, it's been some animated things about like making, making such things like kind of be able to communicate with us and stuff. That's uplifting. Uh, I think this is the last one of these, um, how to make a better human. Uh, and this is a good transitional thing because now I'm going to start talking about the sort of nanofactual or, um, or um, anyway, so the three major components in, in, in most people's opinions about, you know, it's, it's like a, there's, there's also um, cognitive, but life extension, nanofacturing, intelligence, explosion. So you have artificial intelligence research or, or exponential um, progression of of, of ever smarter things. You have nanofacture, you know, making things out of ever smaller stuff. Uh, and then you have uh, life extension or rejuvenation therapies. The, the idea basically that Western medicine has always been in the direction of, of keeping people healthy. Logical conclusion of that is that like if you really keep people healthy, you actually keep them young. And if you keep them young, then people tend to not die, right? Like, or unless they get hit by a bus. So, uh, uh, to, just to correct people who want to go from life extension, skipping all the way to immortality, doesn't mean immortality because you, you know, there's there's no ending death per se. That's a way more difficult problem than keeping people young, right? So, most people who actually talk about life extension are actually talking about peop making people young or younger 
um, actually rolling out biomedical technologies, um, just almost equivalent or akin to immunizations, which you know, it's, I don't think it's any accident that, that vaccinations and stuff are a really big deal now, because actually what's going to happen is we're going to start to have other kinds of therapies, gene therapies, lateral um, modifications to the body to keep some people younger, maybe not some others. Um, that, that's, I think they're connected, honestly. we we'll get into that later. Mall mods, okay, so future studies led to looking into atomic, uh, as well, nanofacture, atomic precise manufacturing. This is like the idea of uh, making things from the atom up. Um, so it's like, okay, well, uh, I'll, I'll jump into that which depicts all of that. And, and, and so I looked around and I talked to some friends, that, and one of whom ha actually happened to be working at a biotech company in La Jolla when I was doing grad work and they were writing molecular modeling software. So they were writing software for people that do pharma, like design, design molecular structures, either mostly it, uh, they were organic, so they were trying to do biological systems. Um, but I, I quickly started to uh, ingest all this, uh, thinking about uh, nanofacture, Kark Drexler, it was a, it was a huge early comp um, proponent of a, of a um, in fact, he's the guy who came up with the, 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 the warning of Grey Goo. Um, he did it, in, in his opinion, in a proactionary way rather than a precautionary way. So he wasn't saying, let's not do this research. He was saying, oh, here's a thing we need to avoid. Let's proceed anyway, but in a sandbox, in a very careful kind of way. Um, yeah, most scientists working on this stuff are, are also the people like most paranoid about how well to contain certain problems beforehand. Uh, anyway, uh, let, me, let me back up. So I had to build a bunch of systems. Um, I, I built like render farms and I started working primarily with this tool PyMol, which is a Python-based molecular modeling tool. It's basically specialized 3D virtualization software exclusive to looking at molecular structures. So not unlike any other 3D program, except this is like ball and stick representation or secondary structure of, of a protein, which would be like, so this is kind of what my palette looks like. So what these look like, actually wait, let me, this is when I can back up here, hold on. I will show. Uh, so I started writing Python scripts. This is on Curator, because a friend of mine came through and um, uh, so I'm writing scripts that take, I'm, I'm borrowing uh, models from the protein data bank and from people actually doing this molecular research. And then what I'm doing is I'm, I'm writing scripts to alternatively formally um, represent those same uh, spaces. So I'm using like the, the atoms as the coordinates to then draw. So it's generative in the, in the sense like generative drawing or, or um, um, coding for drawings, but I'm using that structure as like an armature. Um, let's see, and then I get to this. Now I get to this later. So I run all these, all this code. Oh wait, no, no, no. Sorry, one more, we got to go to this. This, this is what we do. So th okay, this is a screen grab. This is what I wanted to try to do here real time, but I couldn't because I, I, I'm Linux and my whole everything I'm doing is compiled for that environment. So th this tool doesn't actually exist except in a proprietary way for, for PC. Anyway, so this is an example of PyMol. Uh, and so the script you just saw, I would run on, on that virtual molecule. That virtual molecule a, a represents a sheet of graphene which is just an arrangement of carbon atoms. This goes, okay, here's all these carbon atoms. Start drawing. And the drawing is actually, um, like I said, alternative representations of the same coordinates. I'm taking, I'm taking the armature, going, hey, draw a mesh here, a uh, dot representation of this atom there. This bit off to the, to the right here is, uh, is an amino. So I'm doing generative crystallography on the in, in, in these systems. Uh, which basically means I'm, I'm building amino chains. I'm actually like doing generative protein building off of some of these substrates, thereby like kind of taking. Uh, well, here's the good art thing to say. You know how a drawing is graphite on paper? 
like in a thing. This is like putting the paper on the graphite. Like this is the scale at which like those easy relationships kind of invert. So there's graphene, uh, and then on graphene, I'm growing aminos. Right. Uh, can I go to the next one? Ah, there we go. So, and this is running the same script. So here's an example of me running the same script, and it'll pop these out like every four to ten seconds. Okay, so now we can go back here. So this is what my palette looks like. So after I algorithmically automate all these formal derivations and generative crystallography, I'll mass all these renders uh, uh, and sort of I curate thereafter uh, kind of uh, picking for the most nano novelty or like what's most novel about this particular structure. Like this is all sheets of graphene represented differently using the language and rubric of that research software itself. Right. So these are some of the early ones, which then they were, they were quite clear, like I was doing um, balloon animal type molecules. And, and this, this is, I have yet to like go back to this, but I was really proud of this made in the DNA. I thought that'd make for a really good shirt. Like, so like <laughs> Americanization of genetic engineering, made in the DNA. You know, uh, uh, yeah, more molecular balloon animals. Yeah, these these are about ten years old now, I think. Uh, it's carbon nanotube there. Uh, Simography. I liked the idea that, like, if I could algorithmically generate bonds between atoms in these environments, that's not unlike, you know, simography or, or um, um, uh, in, in the 70s, it was quite popular to take thread and nails and a board and then you go back and forth like this and make almost spirographic kinds of geometric structures. Uh, and, and this, so this is when, like, all of a sudden I got to six feet. You know, I started showing, showing these as, I mean, it's almost that big or just slightly smaller than that as, as a print. It's a 2D print, um, but again, everything you're looking at is representative of a nanoscale molecular structure. So these have what I, I sort of refer to as like an extended legibility. It's like, the, like artists come to this with one type of kind of language, and then, but scientists come to this with a whole other one, right? Like, like they'll actually pick out forms and kind of recognize things on the, on the science side. Uh, and they'll recognize certain aestheticizations or like artifications of their language. And then on the art side, they realize they, they are almost intimidated by the technicality or the, the, the um, like wondering if they need to know what everything is at any given time. This one actually is, if for those of you who know what cross-eyed stereo is, if you cross your eyes and you make the stuff that repeats in there meet, that will actually be stereo. <laughs> And, a, and a, at this time, I was like interested in this like perceptual thing, or what? Are you, are you familiar with lenticular? It's like a holo hologram. It's like a, it's a 2D image that appears to have a shallow depth to it, by way of a lenticular lens lenses on top of the image. Anyway, I started making those, and that's what this is, and and it's doubly 3D. So I described one kind of 3D cross-eyed stereo, but actually, if you were in front of this, it would have another. Uh, 3D that was lenticular 3D, so it was two different 3Ds at the same time, and I don't think anyone else has ever done that. <laughs> I've never heard of anyone who, like, two entirely different 3D systems collapsed onto the same picture, picture plane. That details, graphene, that one's a stereo one too, if you can see the... I'll just breeze through these because I'm going to get to, how are we doing on time? Yeah. So, I mean, besides like fractalizing, you know, um, uh, aminos and doing crazy carbon chaining off of these forms algorithmically, I was also tweaking um, rendering, lighting, I was glitching out meshes, like, you know, literally algorithmically pushing and pulling on, on vertices and such. Alternative colorizations, almost like an all of the above all kind of palette.
and quite a bit of this was manually put together, well, manually, but in GIMP. So there is compositing with some of these because it would be too computationally intensive to actually render these as one, as one picture. Uh, it's almost the opposite of how most 3D works. Most 3D simplifies their model with low polygon counts and then you know, does image mapping and so on. To, so, so that's not as computationally intensive. My stuff's the opposite. Like I have like millions of objects in some of these molecules, right? Like molecular modeling is in, in intensive that way. So it's like the dynamics of folding because all the atoms have like particular energies and stuff. Uh, so, so that's why I keep like the texturing to a minimum and the, and 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 I'm just dealing with like densities of actual object. But as I say, like I compose it different orders, which is something that I think is true of, of artists working in most materials. Like sometimes I'm programming in, or, or composing in code, and then, and then I'm all the way to like, like I said, kind of hand, assem hand assembling, you know, even virtually, you know, the relationships thereafter. And it's almost like um, units of computational uh, interventions. Like I have scales and particular points of intervention at any given time. I tend to say about, about these, it's a, it's not, these aren't projects, it's a practice. Like I'm practicing making these. Like I don't consider each one of them a, a, a project, which is why you can tell that my presentation isn't set up that way. It's bodies of work, but I'm not going in. Then I started on this project, and then I started, you know. Uh, it's more of a brickler bottom up. It's not. It's not a you know a higher order you know um, pl plan and execute you know kind of way of going about making art. Uh, right here, I can get through these. Uh, oh, I was going to show. Uh, yeah, I was going to show you. So this was featured um, a year or so ago. This one's called a. Uh, and the names are all pretty much like the text piece I did. I, I did when I started the talk. This one's called Atomic Kill Threads. And this was featured at um, in a show called uh, uh, Dissident Futures in San Francisco, and and they 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 blew this up to, to like the side of their building, and it was like three stories high, and I didn't know that they did this, and and I'm like at the opening, and I walk out, and then all my friends are like, stand right there, and I'm like, what? Okay, and then they started all taking pictures of me, and I'm like, what? And I turned around, it's like that is like three stories high behind me. It's quite, quite a unique moment, I think, in like an art career. It's just like, oh, all right. And they hadn't told me at all. Uh, so there's a buckyball there. And this is an example, actually, of me coding for this carbon chain. Like, you know, it's like nano nonsense, somewhat. You know, I mean, I'm still working in the language of, of what the parameters would be to build a, an, an, an atomic chain. It's not infeasible, but, you know, it, it might not ever be fabricated, is what I'm saying. It's just outside of what, you know. Uh, that some of this is pretty clear. Like, you see proteins here and more of the string art type somography stuff going on there. Start exploring a kind of anime styled outline, like line drawing kind of. Uh, I'm also borrowing sometimes nano machine components from people actually trying to design um, machines at the nano scale. I mean, there's already kind of a repository. Like the moment, like literally the moment, like we could put atoms where, where we want, like people are already working on the toolkit like of, of what we would put together. Model on, you know, stuff on our scale. Like I think this is a pump. So like, you know, I put, these are carbon nanotubes, carbon nanotubes, that's a pump. What's it, what's it pumping? I don't, you know, I don't know. But, the, but we will have such things and at that scale. All right, so at a certain point I realized, uh, hmm, there's this desktop you know, 3D printing, zeitgeist happening. And, and I was thinking, you know, speculatively about nanofacture and such. I was like, hmm, I, in relationship to 
nanofacture, 3D printing is kind of a gateway drug. And so I'm on the record calling it just that because I, I do think like some of the ideology is running amok with regard to how people think about copying objects from one place to another. Well, come to pass is actually a bit dangerous when this all ha starts to happen at the nano scale, right? Or at least we ought to be like prepared to really think through some of these things. So, I, I, all right, so I'll, um, I'll, I'll start um, 3D printing, right? So here, here's an example of a bunch of my modified molecular models uh, then, then converted into meshes. This is Blender now. Um, you know, which some of you can work with, but it's a really nice sort of open source developed 3D printing or a 3D uh, modeling tool, it's a Linux environment. So this is what they, they look like when I was kind of slicing up, you know, all the models that you saw that were deployed in the 2D pieces. Um, uh, that, that this is a, this is actually represents like what I was talking about, about like thousands of objects and, and like objects inside objects inside objects. So I have to actually simplify these by doing like uh, marching cube algorithms to find the, the actual surface and simplify them. Uh, this is getting into to ripping. Um, in other words, uh, for those of you who don't know, you, you take a model and then you slice it in order to, to do FDM 3D printing. But I have these out of order because I'm going to show my 3D printers now after this, I think. But so, the, and actually, this is kind of a, you, you can see it describing an, uh, like one of my models in slices. So it'd be this is like the top of the model, and you know, this is like going down into the. Um, so I did to do custom uh, script, I mean, it's Skineforge, but I modified it with Python, because my, my whole tool chain is Python, fortunately. And uh, so I can, you know, modify how it slices my models. So here's one of my printers. Uh, all of my stuff is RepRap oriented. I started, you know, like almost early adopter style. This before, you know, MakerBot and Ultimaker and, and um, all the sort of um, um, kits. And, you know, this is, so I was sourcing all this stuff myself. Uh, there are second generation Mendels, or the second generation RepRap called Mendels. Uh, the, for those of you who know Joseph Prusa, like he printed my first parts for my first printer. So it's like, you know, I don't know how many years that is now. So I named them all, and you can see that how speculative the names are. So this is Foglet Faber Fidel, Percet Pus Pandora, Cubit Quacker Quinn, uh, and Borganic Blobject, Blobject Hoodlumus Beulah. Uh, I, so I took the first one, and of course, immediately started printing more, right? The self replication, you know, model. And um, and as you can see, these are these are really lo-fi, and I um, I, ba I basically wanted to build them and tune them to behave like more like painting assistants, uh, and I, and I wanted I wanted to know more about them so that I had um, a, a greater sense of almost painterly techniques born of my relationship with these things, kind of part partly why I I named them, but also to be so this is like a sense of how my molecular models then print you know, after having been sliced on one of those machines. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sort of induce the, the, the most gamut of artifacts, those things that kind of, you know, happened with thermal plastics at that scale, you know, at, at, at certain rates, fast, cheap, and out of control, um, to kind of like render the, the molecules as brush strokes. Uh, or to try to just walk that walk that line, to not so literally reduce them to muck, but you know to to have a painterly depiction of that 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 same space. So and then I just accumulate almost like the two D prints you saw accumulate all these um, all these models of certain uh, scales. You know, some really small, almost like um, mosaic pieces. These more like, you know, bricks and or, you know, um, uh, you know, so some of that I, I started experimenting with coloration, you know, because with FDM, which is just, you know, extruding the thermal plastic, uh, you're, you're usually limited to just the filament feedstock you're putting in. So I'm colorizing with indelible pens. Um, I have a, f a f custom filament stitching system, so I could take different colors of filament and stitch them together ahead of time. That's what these sticks are. Like these things that look like twigs, those are actually like multicolored filament sticks that I, that I put together. But that's how I achieve this coloration, which, which if, 
to, to get, you'd have to use something like an, a Z-Corp printer, which is like pigmented glue and gypsum, and they're ridiculously fragile, and, and we can talk about that later. But uh, suffice it to say, I, I'm playing around with color with 3D printing, you know, like, like a painter does with a palette. And you know what, I didn't start this talk saying is that I'm actually trained as a painter. Can you believe that? Uh, I mean, and, and I don't have any formal CS computer science training uh, at all, but so the whole time I'm thinking like a painter. Uh, uh, so these are just bins of all my prints. Because so, I don't print and then, and then compose or print like one-off pieces. I, I print and I almost like my previous 2D prints, I amass the parts um, that then get assembled. Um, they get sorted like, oh, okay, here's this palette, this coloration. You know, so I'll just cover my studio with just all these different kinds. And so all those are 3D prints um, from all my machines. Um, and this is like an example of one of my substrates. Like initially I started uh, assembling these things on plexiglass. So I, I did the welding myself. So I did the acrylic welding. So there's a relatively large piece of what it looks like actually like as I'm assembling it. Um, it's very sort of brick lure, tinker. Um, uh, uh, assembled as I have parts, and I'm building, you know, object to object relations, um, you know, based on the relationships and such. Um, here's a, another one. Every once in a while, I'll do a monochromatic piece. Details. I'll hold that there because I realize that's auto advancing. I'm getting towards the end now. Uh, that these are the pieces I'll be ending with. Uh, but what I wanted to say about these particular pieces is that uh, I have two of the printers tuned to do sort of more of what you'd consider an object, and then others that are doing something more like um, relief sculpture, flatter. Um, types, piece, types of pieces. So some are actually like sliced models and then some are like depth maps that um, are then executed almost like, so you see how this is flat, you know, but, and, but that's not paint, that's actually a 3D print. 3D print on the back of the plex. Uh, so I'm printing like painting, but then I'm, I'm painting on the surface as underpainting in order to then reconcile the picture. So I use paint actually to affix the parts to the, the substrate. I don't paint on the prints. The prints have the color that they have. Uh, and in order to reconcile a picture, I am painting, but it's only underpainting. Um, uh, the, these, particular, these particularly serve to, to um, I think, it, as a, they serve as an example of, of this statement, uh, which I can unpack in Q&A maybe. But um, I think it's important to problematize prototyping right now, to expose that which ain't yet exhausted or collapsed into fully exploitable usability in a functionalist sense. And, and by that, I mean, you know, <laughs> copies are never copies. <laughs> I, it's th that something is a co copy is a functionalist argument, and, it's, and, it's, and it has a utility that, you know, we, we ought to always be skeptical about. It's another thing to think that the that creating an object has a, a gamut of, of artifacts and points of entry and, and um, versions of copy that have been skipped, have been skipped in, in, the, in the functionalist manner. So I'm actually going to you know, um, um, places, uh, 3D printing, trade shows and stuff, talking about um, you know, this, what I, what I consider a, a sort of um, short term or short sighted um, you know, ideological problem that's like inherent in, in almost the, the, the hype and zeitgeist of, of fab labs and fabrication and, uh, and democratizing that thing because, well, it's like, uh, 
I, I always tell students, are, are you a user or are you a super user? You know, are you an admin? You know, to, 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 you know, like beware of something that says no service, you know, user serviceable parts inside, right? Like, uh, uh, I, could, I could just let this run out now. Uh, it's acrylic, but I'm making the paint from pigment dispersions and acrylic emulsion. So I'm, I'm actually like geekly making paint too. It's not, it's not from tube kind of stuff. Oh wait, I know what I'm going to end with is my, uh, my new printer. And then we can do some Q&A and I'll, I'll think, I'll see if I forgot anything. I like to get like from, from textile and, and and it, th these things almost looking like fabric all the way to, to it, it looking like, you know, uh, goo, fleshy, painterly. Oh, why I call them species tool beings is, is important in this series, is that um, species being is what Mark said you kind of had to know about something in order to extract labor capital out of it for the market. <laughs> tool being is what Heidegger was talking about, all of Graham Harmon of Triple O, but tool being um, uh, was, was related to this idea of how objects kind of disappear in use. Uh, that's that's the end of the presentation. That's that's not the end of the presentation, but uh, that things disappear in use. Uh, Heidegger's sense was that like you 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 can never in theory get to the thing because the thing would always disappear into its use. So you actually you know it was almost anti-phenomenological, um, right? Because like, he was the student of Husserl, uh, or trying to do the counterpoint to that which came before, philosophically speaking. But uh, uh, Right, yeah, where is it, where is it going with that? Tool, tool being has been since updated because the object-oriented ontological idea about tool being is that like all objects withdraw from epistemological exhaustion, meaning you can, you can never know completely everything about something like all the time, it's to varying degrees. And that's what I meant about this you know, problem with the functionalist copy, is that like, you know, copy isn't, you know, or it's always, um, it's, there's always a gradient of what gets to count as a copy at any given time, and it's important to figure out like exactly how how the idea of a copy came to be before the copy actually happens, or or you know vice versa. Tool being and species being are, are two important concepts with regard to that that I folded into this uh, this this practice or that series uh, uh, ideologically speaking. Now uh, let me show you. Uh, Not that, we'll go to Instructables. Uh, so I was telling some others about this um, residency Pier 9 uh, through Autodesk. And you know, actually, to apply, you have to do an Instructable. You have to be an Instructables member, and you have to post something. So here's what I posted, and I can, I can show you guys this. This is my newest printer, which looks nothing like the, the RepRap Mendels you just saw. This thing's four feet, or it's like, it's. The, the, the inside di diameter is like three feet. The outer diameter is like four. But this is basically, you know, a, a scaled up rep wrap. You can see, uh, you can see the Arduino shield here, power supply, for those of you who want to see. So I designed this from the ground up. I pretty much built it in like a week. Like once I decided I was going to go ahead and do it. Uh, printed all these black parts here. Uh, printed this carriage. Uh, and the rest is just aluminum extruded, uh, extrusion, motors, um, and uh, various fix, uh, um, fixtures and uh, connection, connective parts that you can get via hardware or online. That's the other side. 
here, here's my, ca my, my uh, ad hoc cable management system, which is actually strings hanging from a pipe in my studio. <laughs> you know, um, so the thing about like being able to modify uh, your own gear is that you know, like I can just print all the attachments I need for the print head. So in this case, it's a plotter like attachment. So like I put a pen in there, and then this thing does drawings for me for a while. And then here's a paint extrusion system that I designed. That it it uh, the motor on top actually has a worm gear and it pushes it plunges a, a paint in a syringe. Um, uh, akin to some of you might have heard of the frost rooter or the paste extrusion uh, system. So it, it fits a 60 milliliter syringe, and it's and it's quick changeable. Or uh, I wanted it to be quick release. So actually, I could throw in a syringe and like and just pin it, you know, with certain kind of uh, attachments, and then run it until it runs out, and then I can swap in another one. So I can mix colors ahead of time. So here's kind of a, a sense of what I'm doing with it. So that's, a, that's an automated painting, essentially. Or it's like extruded paint. Uh, that one's a, more akin to frosting, because so, it has the paint extrusion system on it. This one's a pour. So instead, I, so I call them plotted pourings. So instead of uh, what I did is because I'm mixing my own paint, I just made the paint to the viscosity that would drip at the perfect flow rate that the feed rate of my printer was operating at. And I actually realized like I could get these kind of, you know, drippy but well articulated paintings, you know, without actually plunging. Uh, very few of those. So here's a plasterian example. So this is a hot end on it that's actually you know pumping thermoplastic. That's three millimeters. Uh, this print is over two feet. So actually that's happening like you know like this. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's, to my knowledge, only one commercial, or no, a two. There's a Gigabot, and then there's, um, oh, I forget. Anyway, two or three commercial. What's that? Yeah, rep, big, rep. big rep. Yeah. <coughs> like, uh, it, besides building it yourself, like these are actually really expensive, even though they're they're based on the same rep wrap, you know, guts as as anything else. Uh, he, here's an example of it doing a two foot piece. Uh, and that's that's plastered, and I'm using the new E3D Volcano head, which um, it, it uh, I'd recommend it for machines here because it just like pushes plastic like nobody's business. E3D Volcano. Head. E3D Volcano. If you want to speed, what's called speeding in the industry, like print faster. <laughs> if you want to print faster, uh, the side effect is that you know your layer heights are, are huge and and. Uh, 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 all right, Q and A. That's that's it. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Yeah. It's, it's, it's always weird the performative post clapping kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Let's see if I forgot anything. What's that? Oh. <laughs> uh, can you? I don't know how you could talk about it through the last works you showed, but. Your view of the future in terms of like science positivism, because all the pieces you did that were the child's writings mm -hmm. and the child's drawings, almost all of them only ever dealt with the self and their relationship with the machine. Seldom, almost never, was it a relationship between them and another human being. Um, does your work like exclude relationships between human beings? Because it's very much about your relationship uh -huh. with machines, mm -hmm. and your relationship with technology, and your relationship right. with yourself. Well, I, I, th I think that would become just as conflated as the difference between building and growing. Like, okay, if building and growing is already going to, you know, um, incur uh, conflation, so will, so will uh, what gets to count as a human or a machine. So I actually had the argument that that slippage should, should have been present in those drawings to begin with. I mean, I call that series Compile a Child. Like, I'm already talking about building, building, yeah, don't birth kids, build them. Well, they often yeah. birth themselves. <laughs> hmm? they're, they're birthing themselves in a lot of them, like the divvies or the duplicates. Or right, the or rebuilding, yeah. 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 Or, or like the, the neuronal mapping, n neuronal re remapping, rebuild. Um, yeah, I, I, that stuff will just get faster. Like, like we're, we're we're, kind of, we're subjected to having to build ourselves all the time, actually in relationship to others and so on, challenged in that way. 
um, I think that will be accelerated by some of these other types of relationships. I mean, um, her is kind of an example of like that, like yeah. uh, cold from. There's there's another really good one. Um, it's a short story, but it's about um, dating AIs. People like you know. So you have an a, a but you know it's digital butlerism is what kind of they call it. Digital butler. You have a something that's helping you around all the time, right? Well. Um, well, it'll, it'll come to pass with the, the, the day Butler says no. <laughs> you know, like, you know, do something for me. No, no, I'm not, not going to do that for you. On the other hand, it's like we have to deal with the ethics of, like, couching an AI, right? On the, it's going to be slavery again. Not only machines, but a AIs. It's like couching them right on the precipice of being that which gets human rights. But, like, the company will go, no, 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 no. Isn't that what Chappie's doing? It's like, yeah, yeah right. Like, that, that's that been going on in short sci-fi form for a, a while, these issues of, like, how close you can get before. It's, an, it's the other kind of uncanny valley. It's the uncanny valley that is um, consciousness and its relationship to, you know, how you operate as an individual with rights and in, in society. But, like, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm positive and, and an advocate of like almost omnidirectional exploration of these situations. Like I'm not, I'm not saying machine or people, I'm saying everything in between, all directions. Like let's, you know, let's play. Let's like be careful about the sandbox we're playing in. But, um, and I think the smartest people working on this stuff, you know, aren't driving it into those dystopic or disasterbatory ways. They're actually really, really careful about the sandbox, and they're kind of happy about playing in that sandbox. And um, yeah, I handle it. Yeah. Um, I have uh, two questions. The first is to go off of kind of like the, you know, multiple scenarios you just talked of. Uh, when you were talking about how you're doing the Python scripts and everything, and these are generative crystallographies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and that obviously led to the more three-dimensional work. Do you view all of these separate works as instances? Like, they're not related, none of them are part of a bigger picture, they're all separate instances. None of them could be combined to be ever be part of one painting. They're all separate instances, different possibilities. Hmm. I, an oblique answer would be like I, I tend to think of truncation a lot, not in like a painter, you know, thinks of an edge, how, however kind of um, artificial, in, in terms of like your relationship with a picture space or, or what you mean to to depict pictorially. It, it's like, you know, the first line you put on a canvas is actually the fifth, right? Because it's like there's one, two, three, four, five. You know, thinking through that stuff is I think important. And I think I could, I can, I could, I mean, I don't have to now, but I could maybe talk, I have a whole talk on just truncation. Like what, where's stuff carved up? Like I'd already mentioned, like I'm composing at the level of code. I mean, I, I, I'm letting machines compose running code. You know, I'm, I'm doing all these real time operations on the actual print bed. It has parameters, you know, um, uh, it's almost like uh, e, 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 uh, the people I suggest people read are Ian Bogost uh, and Graham Harmon. Ian Bogost is particularly interesting because he he has a program, I think it's at Georgia Tech, called uh, Platform Studies. And it's kind of an update on media theory. Uh, it's media theory plus like you know, um, compu um, computer science or computational platforms. Uh, it's the idea that you, know, you have novelty not just at the level of, of a new medium, you, you have novelty like in, in huge gamuts even within that transition, especially when it's computational. Like you're running, you know, emulated hardware on hardware. It's like after universal computing, see, this issue truncation, I mean, I, I'm answering your question like way circuitously, but the issue of like where you carve something up gets all the more complicated if you don't even know what like layer you're on. Of, of the emulation stack, <laughs> you know. Um, same goes for artificial reality, and you know. Um, yeah. Cool. yeah. <laughs> uh, I say. Oh wait, actually, there's a line here. I was going to say. Oh yeah, yeah. The way I see it, real-time instantiation of at-will thought forms. It's like right here becomes a freedom of expression issue real quick because post printability of anything means we won't just be saying stuff, we'll be saying stuff directly into stuff itself. 
like we're talking about like real time manifestation of communication in, uh, into objecthood. Like, you know, like when we're in Fab Labs, it's kind of like what we're seeing happen, right? You're like, oh, this thing's like just, it's, it's you know, eventually it's going to be more like magic. And it's just going to be like, poof, it's actually in the foglets, in the air, the objecthood. Uh, but that becomes a freedom of expression issue because then what's the new form of yelling fire in a theater? Right? But as an object. Like, can you make an object in the room that's like illegal immediately, you know what I mean? Or something akin. Yeah, we'll have those issues and they'll be like physical, visceral. Yeah, anyway. Um, so, at one point you showed like the buckyball that was a, an amino strand. Mm. Um, so these are like proteins and building blocks of life. Do you see these as like potentially when the possibility comes, like making living sculptures or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's like a. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, you can already do sculpture that's powder, kind of. Like you can, you can have stuff synthesized at the molecular scale, kind of. You know, um, there's a new company that just that just came out that, that suggests they can print for you bits of DNA, like on the cheap, like the price to actually print DNA. Literally, like oh, you give them AGC, you know, and then they like just do 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 do, and then they send you powder, because that's that's what it is. And then you take the powder and you put it in a cell, and the cell with its machinery does its thing with the with the strand. So that's already that's already happening. That's not like, and I, I was scanning this because the next bit is uh, stuff itself, you know, there's a bit about life. Um, s scale of, the, the issue is emergence. It's not, it's not so much like what will happen at the cellular scale, it, it's what happens in an emergent, you know, um, almost you know, chaotic, literally in the mathematical sense, uh, way of generating novelty but from ever smaller building blocks up. And whether or not, like you could probably truncate and, and control and sandbox those types of things becomes the issue. Uh, one of the, uh, I'll name three books for you all if you want to like get play catch up. But one of the one of the ones that impacted me quite a lot was Blood Music, by Greg Bear, and and that's a description of a biological singularity that that begins with the. Um, the invention of the ability of white cells in the body to cluster as a colony and actually begin to communicate and they, they quickly achieve intelligence and then so the host body then it has like an intelligence within and then eventually it figures out it's his brain and it starts to talk to him and it redesigns his whole central nervous system from within you know it just starts playing with the healing aspects of the body from within starts to mani manipulate the host from within um, it's an example of a really nice scale, scale problem. Like, of, um, you know, for, you know there, there was this first contact, you know, there was these first contact tales of like meeting something that's like almost exactly like us. It's humanoid, you know, it does math and, you know, it's all. But that's, you know, some of the best sci fi stories are actually about like meeting something that's totally other with a capital O. It's like you don't even have that humanoid thing. It might not even be at the same scale. And it's like, how do you, you know, it's like, how do you talk to an intelligence cluster that's actually within and talking to you through your own head? Like, you're gonna think you're crazy. You're not gonna think, you know, it's, it's a system, an other with which you're, gonna, you're supposed to have like a compassionate relationship with you, right? You know, you'd be like, get it out. Like, get it, get, you know, maybe, right. You know, like, can, can we, can we be more comfortable with this, these scale intelligence relationships? That's kind of what I start to think about when, when people talk about building life. I'm like, nah. We can already build, like, you know, bioremediation. We can already make, you know, certain kinds of scales of life. But once, once, it, once it gets to that, we have to have, like, a civilized relationship with things at a bunch of different orders and scale. And then remember pace, like, thinking at different paces. Okay, what if, there are, what if all the entities we handle are, like, are at different scales, like, can barely, like, recognize each other, and they're running at different rates? And it's like, oh, yeah, you know, how do you, how do you broker that? I call it like um, social brokerage. I think there's going to be a whole field of like just brokering interactions between like completely different entities. It'd be like translationware, but it'll be like you know translate not just what you're saying, but like how you are. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like uh, that's on the record. That's on the record. Um, 
Yeah. Oh, yeah, um, Accelerando by Charlie Strauss. Mm. Uh, Hanu Rayaniemi, his name's really difficult to pr um, spell, but the book's called The Quantum Thief. I think everyone should read The Quantum Thief, Accelerando, maybe Blood Music. I mean, there's a short story, Blood Music, that's actually, I think, you know, quicker to the point than, um, um, there's some interesting stuff about like uh, the wiki, like wiki everything. Like, you know, you have like massively disseminated participatory like everything all the time and like what that would be like, you know, like, like, you know, like each of you could be president for a day just because it's like inf it's shuffling, like, it, like all positions in, in society are shuffling and, and like peer reviewed and like based on reputation currency and stuff. Dr. O, Cory Dr. O, I'd recommend to you because he's all over quite a lot of this. He, he actually is smart enough to, to not call himself someone who's like way out um, hard sci-fi. I think he refers to what he does as radical presentism, which is kind of a really nice way of thinking about sci-fi because you are extrapolating from contemporary conditions. You're not, you know, like if you're not, then actually it's not hard sci-fi, it's actually fantasy. Like because in a lot of, you know, most of the sci-fi section in any bookstore is fantasy. There's probably like, you know, this much that's actually like hard sci-fi based on contemporary conditions and they're extrapolating from like what is even now considered feasible but really hard to implement, you know what I mean? And then not only do they describe how it might be implemented, <coughs> then, they, then they attempt to deal with like what the social impact and ramifications of that implementation would be. That's kind of the best stuff, yeah. So, uh, so I just want to say that uh, the contemporary art world ha has a fairly limited uh, set of forms or, or set of forms for engaging artists. And certainly one of the things you've done is gone far enough into the future. You know, it's indeterminate exactly how far. And it's also speculative in the sense that it's not here or it's not mm -hmm. for sure. But uh, how do you uh, grapple a little bit with being how do you grapple with the limitation of forms in the contemporary art world, you know, and the current uh, kind of, uh, you know, I mean, it's almost as if art is purposefully mm. limited in this environment. Well, that, you know, that's I a... I think this is that truncation issue again. Um, and I've been quite conscientious about truncation in the sense that, like, I, I'm making something that still gets confused as being painting. Mm. And, that, and I do that for a reason. You know, I mean, it's a, I, I like, I like to think of it like a decoy. It's like, these are decoys. <laughs> it's like, it's like, it looks like a painting, but the moment people realize it's not a painting, then it's just like, oh, how, what was it? How is this done on what? Like what, what's 3D printing? And then all of a sudden, like the, the, you know, molecular manufacturing, what? And then all of a sudden the dialogue goes way over, way over there. You know, it's almost, um, uh, I like to think of it in, in terms of seduction, almost like a, you know, you don't, uh, along these lines, there's almost too much spectacle in the art world regarding like new, 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 new. Like, you know, like you, you can make a, sometimes you can make a better point with an old medium than, than you can tripping over all your colleagues to figure out what the newest, most hippest thing is because, you know, you haven't even really figured out what your ideas are yet or whatever. Like, you know, I don't know. I, 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 I don't wonder in part, like, uh, how many people meet you where you are? I mean, hopefully none, because <laughs> I want everyone to meet, you know, it, it, yeah. you know, omnidirectional. Right. You know, I'm not. Right. Uh, it, yeah, it, what you what you're talking about is like uh, the the. Um, it's hard to avoid sometimes being didactic, and and, and almost like, you know, here's my agenda, you know, and the art. I, and I think the subtlety of some of the work and and how it actually you know doesn't get read that way at all or this way, is fine. I mean, I, I, like I, want, I want a kind of a large, cast a large net of, of not interpretations, like interpretationism, no, 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 no. Look, I, no, I, I want to generate, you know, dialogue across, you know, ideologies, like from, from uh, you know, the, the, the arts all the way to the science and so on, and everything in between and how they're, you know, they're, they're actually not so different and so on. Um, it's outreach, I, I mean, when I, when I, when I concern myself with like thinking about um, uh, nanofacture, for instance, yeah, the, there's it was an outreach effort. I considered like the earlier stuff, um, 
what, uh, playground ball pits of pure operationality, all about an atomic admin access pris picturesque. Uh, I wanted to depict both things at the nanoscale and, and things the, like the, the artifacts that are born of, of uh, knowing, knowing as much as you can about a system that, that's doing the 3D printing at the same time. Done. Like, and I think in, if you look at any one of these, it's doing exactly both at the same time. You know, and it's a decoy, looks like a painting, so it doesn't scare those people off. And then, you know, and then it maybe draws the people in that like are, you know, that, you know, or come from biochem or uh, uh, molecular sciences or, um, yeah, so it, that makes sense. I mean, it, it you know, the, um, on, on the verge of being almost institutional, the, the, the descriptions of works that couldn't be there is, is, is one solution to that problem. Like I, I was describing things that like technologically weren't even feasible yet. And this happens occasionally in really good short form sci-fi. You, you don't tend to get it in the big novels that, you know, of sci-fi, but sometimes you get people describing some, some pretty amazing future art uh, in, in their stories. Um, and I can't think of any offhand, but that was definitely kind of what I wanted to do. I wanted to describe things that almost like actually could end up in a narrative, but then, but then it's not there, but it's there. It's the no there there. It's, it's like there's never, there's never really a, a thing there. Um, also, um, to avoid, uh, I, I didn't get to this point earlier, and, and maybe someone will ask about, about this, but uh, my, it, it's, it's just simply lazy and almost easier to depict a future having fallen apart than one having been sustainably built, right? <laughs> uh, uh, on the other hand, yeah, it's so hard that like I, I would concede that even I can't, like you know, don't, you know what I mean? So how 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 interestingly and seductive and and um, and and faithfully and I don't know um, conscientiously could I describe things that you know are positive? moves or wrote innocently seemingly innocuous situations that happen later you know without doing that and that's kind of been the overarching um, compass you know are there some other questions uh, i just have one question <laughs> what planet did you come from and <laughs> when did you come here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, when uh, I tend to say, you know, when I when I'm asked where I'm from, I say my mom. I, I answer my mom, you know, credit, credit that. And then I go, no, 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 it's sorry, no, I haven't been built yet. You know, like, e e yeah, either it's, uh, that, that's my answer to the from. <laughs> you know, if, if I ha yeah, if I have to admit that I've been born, I, I will, I will, I will second that by saying I haven't been built yet. Because, you know. Um, so, the whole lecture you were discussing, I guess, the gray area between grown and built, and between man and machine, and between I, like, throughout all your work, I guess. So, you know, this so many questions that beg to be answered, like especially with your work itself, when it comes to the 3D printing and you're self-assembling it, when does the 3D printer become the artist and you just become the 3D printer? Mm -hmm. And there's just like an overarching thing, theme like that throughout your work. Yep. And to be honest, when I would watch the presentation and everything, it just left me with, okay, so now what? You know, mm -hmm. you, you um, present all these questions with what's the future gonna be like? And as you said, uh, usually it's either totally dystopian in like novels, it's either a dystopian future or utopian, which people see as dystopian because it still doesn't work out well. So, like I said, so now what? Like, what are you, what are you trying to say with your work other than mm -hmm. here are the questions? Like, are you providing an answer? Or are you just saying the possibilities that are there? I, yeah, I'd handle this two ways. I'm I was taking notes at the, I mean, to to format this. I think you're talking about agency, like in and and um, an origin, um, you know, a tour authorship, like where, like where 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 you locate that. 
this is a functionalist thing again. This is like extraction of labor capital. What is it? What? Where's the value of the of what author when? I don't. Uh, some people have tried to make machines. Um, the artists. Um, uh, I I almost worked with him. He retired right before I went to UCSD. But um, uh, Cohen, right? Harold Cohen, right? He had Aaron. He had a he had a plotter that he named Aaron, and a and he and he did shows of like Aaron. Like, oh, this is Aaron's art. You know, it's not my art. Well, like, but no, that was a ruse, kind of, because I mean, we we kind of we know better just interpersonally. Um, there's a danger of eroding the profession that way if that happens too fast in every profession, really. I mean, it's like you almost end up with like you gotta think of luddites or something, but like you know, you think of artists going, no, no, you know, machines can't take our artists' job. Like you know, you end up with that you know kind of thing. Um, what was the other point? Because there's a second. Oh, is that um, uh, I, I said some artists are, are they fetishize answers or um, you know some some artists want to you know answer things. I want to create solution spaces, like because I again this is a didacticism dogmatic thing. I don't want to tell people what to do. I want to go okay. Here's a solution space. You know for for yet to be determined amounts of decisions. I you know. I, I'm not. I'm not interested in in, in uh, spectacular answers per se. So, um, and they relate because I think the agency issue is also that gamut of solution space about like how much you want to share in in uh, the experience of making. Remember, making make, making things make. Well, like who's the initial maker, right? Like then we end up with like. Is a quickly infinite regress in either direction. If you're making, 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 like, well, you know, the, the true credit has to be uh, reevaluated. Uh, um, but you don't throw one out in, in service of another. I think there's room for different kinds of evaluation of certain kinds of agency in certain kinds of practices, right? Uh, it may come to pass that you know machines have their own evaluation system for what machines do, and we have no part of it. You know, then what? It's like okay, well, you know, then yeah, you know, we credit each other, they credit them, and we don't even you know. What I mean? uh, cool. Eh. Awesome. All right, good. Thanks, everybody.